when 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 we design um, projects, they they often like even though when we present a project like the the bunker, it seems like like from the beginning there was a clear idea, but the way we arrive at these ideas is actually a much more uh, weird and unpredictable process. This is like a, a typical. Uh, sort of picture of the amount of sketch models that are created for one project that you, you make one model, you learn something from it, you make another one, you learn something from that, you make another one. So um, just to give you sort of a, a picture of what that process looks like, uh, this is a site of a, of a, of a project we're building in, uh, uh, in Switzerland in the uh, Valley du Choux. It's the cradle of watchmaking uh, in Switzerland. Uh, this is our site, it's a beautiful natural landscape. And we were asked to do a museum of, of watchmaking uh, uh, by Audemars and Piquet, uh, uh, the founders of, uh, um, of the Audemars Piquet uh, watch brand. And the site was basically, this is the building where they started making watches up in the atelier uh, 150 years ago. This is their current headquarters. It's a historical street in a small village in Switzerland. So our first intuition was to try to sort of uh, squeeze in between the two old buildings, uh, almost like disappear. Uh, but the more we looked at it, the more it felt like some kind of annoying newcomer budding in between two old friends. So um, we thought maybe we should stay low. Uh, there was a, a series of galleries. We thought maybe each gallery is like a building. They're connected to uh, enjoy views uh, uh, of the valley. Uh, we tried different ways of organizing it. Maybe this chronological journey where you end up uh, uh, connecting to the, uh, to the atelier. Um, at some point we thought maybe we should just really be part of the landscape. Uh, we tried, again, a handful of different uh, ideas. We are in Switzerland. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, each model somehow gives, asks new questions, it points in new directions. And, and slowly the process takes on a life on its own. So what we ended up doing was that we uh, took the brief of the different uh, galleries, the biggest one uh, in the middle, uh, turned it into this uh, linear journey, uh, coiled it up into a double spiral, uh, placed it on the site next to the existing buildings. Uh, you go through, you have the biggest gallery in the middle, and then you sort of continue and, uh, and visit uh, uh, the historical workshop as the last thing you do. We allowed the landscape to sort of slope down with the valley so we get light uh, and air and views into the uh, exhibition spaces. So when you arrive, you have instantly a, a view, a framed view of the valley. You can go through more uh, sort of classic uh, uh, exhibits. You can also walk through some of the master uh, workshops where the watchmakers sit with north facing light as they've done for centuries and work uh, on, the, on the historical timepieces. One of the exciting things is that um, there are no columns uh, in the whole museum. Uh, and, and the thing is that glass is actually um, a, quite, uh, a quite strong material. It's better at taking compression than steel because it's very dense. Uh, it's not, it, it can't take uh, tension. Uh, and if there's an earthquake, it's, it's very brittle, so it, it breaks. Uh, but because it's curving, it's continually curving, the curve, the arc, lends rigidity. So you can see like a, a sheep would just uh, buckle and break, but the curvature gives it strength to resist uh, an earthquake. So in a way, the form of the building actually has structural attributes. So we, we've been capable of building the whole building without a single column. And it also ties into one of the sort of key elements of, uh, of watchmaking is that uh, watchmaking is all about getting the maximum amount of impact out of the minimum amount of, uh, of material. So you have skeletonization, which is about eliminating material. So the, the clockwork becomes like see-through so the, the watch becomes lighter. You have miniaturization, which is about making the, the watch as flat uh, as possible. Uh, and you have uh, a complication, which is about putting as much content into as little material as, as possible. So, so here you can say, uh, 
without even having walls or columns, uh, the roof is still uh, 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 able to, uh, to stand. So you have like this amazing view of the valley. From here, you can journey up into the workshop and, and that's sort of the end of, uh, of your visit. So, so when you explain the project like this, it feels almost inevitable that of course the Museum of Watchmaking uh, uh, is gonna be like this. Uh, you just forget that you had to like kiss 50 frogs before you finally found the, uh, the right idea. Um, it's, it's currently under construction. Uh, uh, this is uh, from this winter. Uh, it's gonna open uh, uh, in the next spring. Uh, no columns still. Um, as, a, as a sort of side effect, uh, when we were building this project, the, the client realized that they, you know, some of these watches cost uh, half a million euros. Uh, so uh, people that buy those watches, uh, they like to stay in nice hotels. Uh, so they thought they needed a small hotel uh, next to the museum. Uh, uh, the valley is covered by snow six months of the year. It's, the, it's part of the longest cross-country ski route in all of the Jura Mountains. Um, so uh, we came up with this idea to, to tap into that. According to building code, we could do a five-story building along the road. Uh, but we thought, so maybe we stretch it out uh, and, and sort of uh, uh, turn it into a sort of serpentine route so that as you, as you move through the landscape, you can actually ski in and ski out to the brasserie, uh, the lobby, the restaurant, and every single room. So the hotel really becomes an extension uh, of the ski slope itself. Um, so in an interesting way, like even though it's you know, the same place and for the same clients, the two buildings, they maybe have some kind of relationship with the landscape, but they have two quite different uh, sort of architectural expressions. But really the first ski in, ski out hotel that I, uh, that I know of. Um, another sort of um, issue that has been following us for, for many years is this notion of sustainability. Um, and sustainability, like when, when Al Gore started lecturing on the inconvenient truth, it, it was like this long uh, lecture about all the things that are going wrong and how we have to stop uh, and how, to, how we have to somehow um, in a way, it felt like we had to change our quality of life. We had to find compromise, uh, almost like this sort of idea of this Protestant idea uh, that we know very well in, uh, in Denmark, uh, that you almost have to take cold showers. It, it has to hurt to do good. Um, so we thought that's not very uh, desirable. So what if we could find another way uh, to make people sustainable? What if sustainable cities and buildings were more enjoyable? Uh, the first time we started thinking about this was when we did the, the Danish pavilion in Shanghai 2010. And the pavilion is conceived as a concentration of Danish city life, complete with the blue bicycle lanes of Copenhagen. Uh, Denmark, or Copenhagen was the first city in the world that had uh, city bikes, the free bicycles. Um, so you could actually come and visit uh, Copenhagen in a condensed version. You could bicycle through the pavilion uh, you could even bicycle through the exhibitions, making it the perfect museum for impatient people, because you could see everything in five minutes from a bike. Um, at, the, at the heart of the pavilion, uh, we introduced uh, the Copenhagen Harbor Bath. Uh, the Copenhagen Harbor Bath was our first project uh, 17 years ago, and it basically extends the life of the city into, uh, into the water. Uh, which means that a clean harbor is not only good for the fish, it's also amazing for the citizens because you don't have to sit in your car for hours to go to the beach. You can literally jump in the port uh, in the middle of the city. So we took this experience allowing the Chinese to experience how clean, uh, if not how cold, Danish harbor water is. Um, and finally we were thinking, how do we get the Chinese to come? Um, you know, if they don't experience the, the thrill of riding a bike or swimming in the middle of the city, it doesn't matter. So uh, we found one common denominator between Denmark and China is that in the Chinese public school curriculum, they have three fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen, the Danish poet, uh, including the story of the little mermaid, the national symbol of Denmark. So we proposed to move the mermaid to China uh, for, uh, for six months. 
uh, it created a, a drama. The Danish Nationalist Party tried to pass a law against moving the mermaid. So I had to go to Parliament and argue her case. And as you can see, we actually uh, we got her. Uh, <laughs> then we had to get her through Chinese customs. Uh, and, and, and finally, uh, we got her to, uh, uh, to the pavilion. Um, as a sort of a compensation, we thought uh, we could make uh, an exchange with uh, a, a Chinese artist, so we invited Ai Weiwei. Um, and, and he installed uh, a Chinese surveillance camera, uh, the same camera that the Chinese state has installed in front of his studio. Uh, but, but this one was transmitting an image to uh, uh, a flat screen that was mounted in Copenhagen so that the, the tourists who would go in vain could see that she was, she was fine, she was just on the other side of Earth. Um, but it also became a loophole in the Great Firewall of China. It was the only uncensored live TV feed from China to the rest of the world uh, for six months. So, so this was sort of the first time that we, um, that we played with the notion of hedonistic sustainability. Um, Shortly after, the, the president of China uh, uh, came to uh, the Queen of Denmark and said uh, that they were very happy with the relationship between Denmark and China, and as a proof, they wanted to donate Denmark to pandas. Um, and, and, uh, and somehow, I, I read about it in the newspaper, and I called up the, the Lord Chamberlain, who's the, 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 the chief of staff of the Queen, and I asked where the pandas going to live. And he said, we don't have a space for them yet, but probably in Copenhagen Zoo. So I called up the director of Copenhagen Zoo and said, we have to uh, design uh, your panda habitat. And, and, and so it was. Uh, so um, one thing we learned about pandas is that pandas are very solitary. Uh, they can't cohabit. Uh, there's a male and a female, and if you put them together, they fight all the time. Um, so in that sense, they're a little bit like human beings. Uh, so. Uh, we came up with this idea, uh, it was too tempting, that it's basically a perfect circle composed of a yin and a yang, one for her and one for him. Uh, and that's essentially the organizing principle. Uh, uh, you can see the panda uh, both at eye height. So from the restaurant, uh, the floor is lowered, so you're actually in the same eye height as the, as the panda. I think no matter what, this is, in, in all the projects I'll ever do, this is the cutest client I will ever have. Um, also, as a, as a side effect, uh, while we were in Shanghai, we got invited to do a competition for the main energy company of Shenzhen, uh, next to Hong Kong. Shenzhen is the most industrious region in the world, uh, and we got invited to design their energy uh, company's headquarters. It's 100,000 square meters of workspace, uh, and we thought, basically, it's a, it's a subtropical, subtropical climate, you want to maximize daylight and views. You want to minimize thermal exposure and glare. So we came up uh, together with Arab with this idea that the facade is like a pleated dress or like an Isi Miyake fabric. Uh, it opens up entirely to the north or, the, or the, the side that has the least direct sun. It's completely enclosed to the south or the side that has the meest, most direct sun. So when you look south, you see bamboo walls washed in daylight. And as you turn your eye and look uh, north, suddenly it's an all glass building. So that means from some angles, it's really entirely glazed. From other angles, it's in entirely uh, protected. Uh, within this logic, we can create larger openings. Uh, so we have a, a stack of sort of executive meeting rooms with a sort of sky lobby, where it's more closed here, more open here. Um, you know, as, as you move away, it's, it's almost like this sort of Lucio Fontana cut. Here, it's adapting to uh, an irregularity on the site, but also creating a, a, a main, main entrance. So this basic logic that, of course, adds some kind of uh, elegance, almost like feminine uh, curvature to an otherwise rather masculine uh, typology, uh, it also uh, reduces the energy consumption with 30%. Without any technology, any moving parts, uh, the, 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 sh the sort of shading strategy means that it spends 30% less energy on, uh, on cooling. Um, but it also, and, and in a way what I like about it is that it's almost like aesthetic sustainability that what makes the building look more beautiful is also what makes it perform more beautifully. Um, 
So in that sense, sustainability is not just a technical upgrade, it can really be a driver for a whole new aesthetic or, or different forms or different textures. Um, and another sort of aspect that, um, that interests us is, is the notion, what you could call architectural alchemy. And of, of course, alchemy is the idea that by mixing traditional metals or conventional uh, um, metals, you can create gold. No one has ever really succeeded. Uh, but in architecture, we can, we can actually create architectural alchemy by mixing different traditional programs in untraditional mixtures and create added value. And I understand that some of you are experts uh, in our work in Copenhagen. Uh, this is the infinity loop or the eight house. And it's basically combining shops, offices, uh, townhouses, uh, apartments, and, and more townhouses. Uh, in a way, uh, it's, it's really at the city limits of Copenhagen. You have other life forms. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but in a way, what we've done is that we placed shops and offices close to the ground where the customers are, uh, townhouses above, exploiting that a commercial floor plate is deeper than a residential floor plate, so we get space for a path, and then we get more apartments and more townhouses. So, in a way, it expands the public realm. You can see here the kindergarten is lifting up the gardens. So suddenly you have uh, public life almost like a, a, a Pueblo Blanco in the south of Spain, like a, a, a mountain village where people uh, live uh, in their townhouses. Uh, these two kids can run down and, and, and visit each other. You see the officers are, are in the courtyard down in the shade and they lift uh, the residences up in the sunshine. So it really sort of, you can say, where public life is traditionally restricted to happening at the street level, here, it's really uh, allowed to invade the three-dimensional block uh, 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 of the, the three-dimensional city block. Again, two girls that live on the seventh and the ninth floor. They don't have to take the elevator down to the courtyard. They can just walk down and, and visit each other. So a whole new kind of community, but in a, in a, in a sort of vertical uh, setting. So, so maybe one sort of interesting aspect is that uh, when you're doing a project like this, uh, I think this is one of the more socially successful things we've done. Uh, of course, you see in the work something like things like this. This is from the, the south-facing courtyard. And we thought there was something interesting here. Here we push the southwest uh, corner down so we can get a lot of sunshine into the, into the courtyard. It gave us an idea uh, for a project we're building in Amsterdam, which is essentially uh, a city block in the port of Amsterdam where you can literally sail your ship into the courtyard, sort of uh, expanding the, uh, the sort of the, the blue element into uh, 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 this sort of private uh, uh, part of the building. It's a building called Slois House, which is uh, currently under construction. So it's almost like the eight house, but, but turned upside down. Um, and also it, um, it inspired a Manhattan real estate developer to invite us uh, eight years ago to come to New York and look at a site on the west side of Manhattan. Uh, it's basically between a power plant and a sanitation garage and the west side highway. Uh, and it's very far from Central Park. So we thought what they really need is an oasis. And you can say the typical European courtyard, this is the, the Copenhagen courtyard where my dad grew up, is at the architectural scale what Central Park is at the urban scale, it's an oasis in the middle of the city, so we, th we thought, what happens when you combine the density and verticality of a skyscraper with the communal space of a courtyard? Essentially, what could a court scraper look like? Uh, so that's what we did. Courtyard, northeast, we give it uh, 500 feet of height to uh, provide the sufficient density. We keep the southwest corner low so we get sunshine and views. Uh, and the result is this kind of rather striking uh, silhouette. This is what it looks like built. Uh, Two-thirds of the homes have terraces. Uh, you have the courtyard actually has the same proportions as Central Park. It's just 13,000 times smaller. <laughs> sort of a, a bonsai uh, Central Park. And it's protected from the noise of the highway, but it still has these framed views of the highway. It's like literally an oasis uh, in the middle of the city. Like all the homes have like little sunken uh, terraces in the sloping roof. And of course, 
Funny, when you see it now, a lot of people think that we were inspired by the sails of the ships on the Hudson, but in fact, it's really the mechanism of, of allowing a courtyard to be successful that has created this sort of rather striking uh, silhouette.